All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm not starting just yet, but I felt you should see this to, to realize the distractions that I'm dealing with working at home. Look at them snuggle. That's Stuart and Colby, and they, they love to snuggle. They sleep together like that all the time. Anyway, those are the distractions that I deal with at home. Yeah. Um, take a minute. All right, it's 12.30. I can start now. Uh, so, today we're going to be talking about integration. Uh, from there, uh, just a reminder that homework, sorry, not homework, I, I, I misnumbered these homeworks. Homework 6 is due tomorrow night. Homework 7 was posted Tuesday. Uh, we will do what we can. Uh, homework 5 grading has started. Uh, we'll do what we can to try to get the grades out quickly. My goal is to have all the grades except homework 6, uh, or excuse me, except homework 7, because there will be a homework 7, except homework 7 available on April 28th, which is the day everyone has to make their decision uh, regarding letter grade versus the credit non-credit option. Um, as for, um, as for the grading in the class, as I posted on Piazza, uh, we will not be having a C minus grade. So the gist of this is going to be, uh, if you get a 69.99% in the class, cause I don't plan to round any letter grade. Uh, six, and, and I feel that's fair because I've already done some, some pretty generous exam grading or curving. Um, a 69.99 is a D plus a 70% is going to be a C. Um, so that is, uh, something that I'm going to be doing. The reason for this is, and I believe this is true. I'm not certain this is true because we haven't been told yet. I believe that when we enter your grade, we will simply enter a letter grade A through F, and it will be converted into the credit non-credit option that corresponds with that letter. But I don't know that for certain. I, I just I, I think that's how it's going to be done. We again have not been told. A reminder of the class breakdown: 50% of your class grade is the homework, so therefore each homework has equated to being roughly roughly um uh, about seven percent of your grade so 50 percent divided by seven it's like seven and one seventh uh so about seven percent of your grade uh so each homework has actually been comparable uh to an exam um which which is not entirely unintended um however the final exam will be worth 20 percent of the final grade so do be aware of that the quizzes are more just to reiterate some points, and they're not intended to be a large part of the grade. So this is our grading breakdown. Are there any questions about grading stuff heading towards the uh, the April 28th deadline to choose letter grade versus uh, uh, pass-fail? <clears throat> All right. Um, well, with that, uh, today we're going to be discussing integration. What do I mean by integration? So integration is the order by which you are going to complete the various programming tasks in your system. Let's think back to homework one slash homework three. Let's say we did something like a three-tiered architecture. So we did a three-tiered architecture where this is our user layer, this is our controller layer, and this is our data layer for some small snippet of the program, say Tweet Reader. My question to you is if you were building this assignment, and by the way, Tweet File Reader implements Tweet Reader. I don't have the right arrow here, but that's because I, I can't really figure out how to make the right arrowhead in PowerPoint. So that's why I just labeled it. Given what I have here, my question to you is which class, and, and by the way, there are also other classes like tweet and state, and we're not going to include those in this argument for now. 
Of the four classes you see here, and again, keeping in mind, this class is actually abstract, which class should you implement first? Which class would, would you, which class did you implement first if you did this type of strategy? Or which class would you implement first? Not rhetorical? Question mark? Okay, we have someone saying tweet reader. Tweet file reader. Okay, tweet file reader. How many people, does anyone think it doesn't matter? You're just going to implement what, it, like, you, you'll you just implement whatever and, and figure out the rest as you go? Or does anyone have any opinion that isn't uh, either tweet reader or tweet file reader? I think it would depend on personal preference, okay. Would start at one of the ends. Okay, uh, Ginger just raised a great point. Start at one of the ends. So most people have said start at this end. Would anyone want to start at this end? User interface. And, and, and sincere answers. Would anyone want to start with the user interface first? And if you did start with the user interface, what difficulties could emerge? For those who actually, let's put it this way. For those who said tweet reader or tweet file reader, why? Why tweet file reader? Uh, either of those questions can be answered. Either why user interface or why tweet file reader? And I know it's probably going to take a bit to type a, a why question. Okay, well, UI calls on functions from its dependencies, so I don't like having the red shame lines under those that don't exist yet. There we go. That's a that's a good rationale. I User interface is going to rely on functions from processor, which haven't been implemented yet. And if they haven't been implemented yet, then we're either going to get compiler errors or these functions aren't going to work. Similarly, processor depends on tweet reader. And so as a result, it seems reasonable to do tweet reader first and then do processor, which depends on tweet reader, and then do user interface that depends on processor. And again, for this case, tweet file reader is just an extension. So we would do the tweet file reader abstract class or the tweet reader abstract class, tweet file reader, concrete class, and then processor and then interface, something like that. Effectively, what this is called is this is called bottom up. So there are a number of strategies to use. And the first is bottom up. And this is probably what a lot of students do. When I tend to write early homework assignments, those assignments tend to be bottom up. You start with the thing. And I want to be clear what the bottom means. The bottom means the thing other objects depend on when we're talking about dependency remember we want these dependencies to be one way not a mutual dependency and so if user interface depends on processor and processor depends on tweet reader then what we would do is we would first implement and also in this case tweet file reader depends on tweet reader is we would first implement the thing with no dependencies no external dependencies so we would implement this first, uh, but not what I meant to do. We would implement this object first, and I'm just going to change that to orange to suggest implemented. We could then implement the things that depend on this, and we could do it, well, in theory, processor depends on tweet reader, but in order to test processor, we need to actually have a concrete tweet reader, right? We can't do abstract. So the next thing we would implement would be tweet file reader, because technically there's an indirect dependency to tweet file reader. Or at least we need some working tweet file reader. So, oh, not what I meant to do. So we implement that. Now, processor still has dependencies, but all of the dependencies of processor are implemented. And so we're going to implement processor. And from there, 
the only class left is user interface. All the dependencies of user interface are implemented. And so we do that. So bottom up is when we implement the class with no dependencies. Then after that, we implement the classes or the modules where all of the dependencies have been implemented. And generally, generally, the order of this, if we're talking a three-tier architecture, is we implement the data layer, then the controller layer, then the presentation layer. And that's probably how most of you would implement the project. And so the idea is if everything, um, so what broad strategies can we interpret from this? Well, we've talked about bottom-up integration. Bottom-up is implement and test modules without any dependencies, then implement the things that only depend on things that have been implemented. From there, we have Big Bang integration. And Big Bang integration is um, integrating without a plan. It's just implementing things as... Uh, as they are done. So keep in mind that technically when we're talking about integration, we're not actually talking about coding these things. Rather, we're talking about integrating this class into the build that has these things complete. Because the idea is programmers can work in parallel. So what we want to do is think about how we can do integration testing, bringing two components together. And bottom-up is, is often the common way to do that. Big Bang integration is just integrating components. Whenever a component's completed, you immediately try to integrate it. And the problem with Big Bang integration is it's it's really without a plan. And hopefully something you've learned from this class is that minutes of planning can save hours of work. Um, that's the hope. And so we don't really want to do Big Bang. Big Bang is just uh, whenever we complete something, we'll, we'll integrate it then. Now, we've done this, and th I am not saying bottom-up integration is bad. I want to be really clear. I'm not focusing on bottom-up integration today, but that's because you probably are more familiar with this approach. Instead, what I want to focus on is top-down integration. This is not to say top-down integration is better. It's just what we're going to focus on today. And top-down integration is first implement and test modules on which nothing depends. So this is the opposite. Before, we test modules without dependencies. This one, we don't care if it has dependencies, but rather we want to say that this module has nothing depending on it. And then we are going to implement and build on this system, adding each feature over time uh, whenever a module only has implemented things depending on it. So in that context, what we would do is which of these modules have nothing depending on it? Tweet file reader has nothing depending on it, but because this is an abstract class, these two are really tied together, so we would still really want to implement these two roughly at the same time. User interface has nothing depending on it. So we're going to implement, in this case, user interface first. Next, we will implement processor. Uh, give me one second here. Sorry about that. Had to blow my nose, and I don't think any of you wanted to see that. Um... So then from there, we can implement these two classes. So we do top down from the thing that nothing depends on to the thing at the bottom that is that has the most direct or indirect um, dependencies or these things depending on it. So bottom up, we go from this class has no dependencies. We do that first. You love watching people blow their nose. That uh, Plague Pleasure, that actually is kind of an apropos name. Because that's how plague spreads. Anyway, um, 
Top down, though, we start with user interface, the thing on which nothing depends. So again, Big Bang integration, it, it's generally considered ad hoc. That is, each individual uh, module is, imp is integrated into the whole just whenever it's completed. This can lead to integration hell. Integration hell is a technical term, even though it doesn't sound like it. And the technical term means... Um, integration hell means the work it takes to integrate a new system is more than the work it would take to re-implement the system such that it integrates more easily. That is to say that the work it would take to integrate this module that you built, it would take so much work, changes to code, etc., that it would be easier just to re-implement rather than do the integration. That's what integration hell is. And when you get to that point, it means your system has such entropy that it's it's just very, very much not maintainable. It's also difficult to test uh, which system. So as you add elements, it becomes hard to detect responsibility. And the advantage of bottom up and top down is it becomes easy to detect responsibility that is where the system failure occurs. So you've done bottom up. So example, we do tweet file reader first and the advantage is you do the development and the integration together so you develop the low level system then you integrate that then you develop the next level up system and integrate that then you develop the ui and integrate that the clear indication of responsibility of errors as you add something if a bug occurs chances are the thing you added caused that bug one problem, and by the way, this is a problem with top-down as well, it assumes those cyclic dependencies. You should avoid cyclic dependencies whenever possible anyway, as it relates to functional independence. We've talked about this. Um, so this is, not a, this is not as big a problem as you should think, because you should be avoiding this anyway. A problem is you're assuming the design is planned out the full way through. That is, you know how you're implementing the data layer, the controller layer, and the UI. Because you start with, I mean, what is an app? An app is something the customer needs, right? Well, what the customer needs is a user interface that performs tasks. The customer does not care about the controller or the data layer. That's you. That's an internal uh, quality measure that you introduce. Customer doesn't care. And the problem with this is that you have to go, you have to take the time to say, okay, here's the UI, and then plan out the controller and the data layer so that you can implement the data layer, then the controller, then the UI. Because generally you start with what does the user want, the user interface. You start with that idea. So this requires a lot of planning. It also makes the assumption that low-level modules are easy to implement and test. That is to say... Um, that is to say that starting here is, is reasonable from the standpoint of you'll be able to finish it quickly, and that may not be the case. Additionally, if implementation finds a necessary design change, you may have to go back and change the lowest data layers um, right away. And the problem with changing the lowest data layers, as we talked about on... Um, oops, that is a weird camera angle. Sorry. The problem with changing the lowest data layers is that I don't have any markers. That's the problem. I have a... There it is. For example, let's say that as we're implementing... We find that once we get up here to the UI we find that we've already implemented, by the way, all of this. We have our data, we have our controller, and we have our UI. Once we get up the, to the UI and the user requests a change, we now are going to have to change the controller and the data layer, potentially, after they've been implemented. Whereas, if we present the user with a UI first, they can provide feedback, and we may be able to change on the fly the controller and data. So I'm, I, again, this is not to say bottom-up is bad. It's not bad at all. It's just that if you're doing something like a minimum viable product, 
the goal being to get something to market quickly. It's often a good idea to start with the UI, to present the UI to customers, get feedback and make changes to the UI before you even mess around with the data layer. Now the question is, how do you do that? How do you present something to the user if you haven't implemented the things the UI uses? And so the key in top down is the use of stubs that simulate the actions of the dependency. They don't produce the same behavior, but they simulate that behavior. You produce stubs. This allows you to fully test the UI independent of the controller and data layer, even though the UI has a dependency. So again, top down, we're not saying it's better than bottom up. It's just that bottom up is something you've probably done before. I want to illustrate top down. Let's say, for example, we were building some kind of homework one type app. And the goal was we want to get all the tweets for a given state. At that point, you might write code in your UI, something like, Get the state, which again is like some kind of scanner prompt that gets the state from the user. You produce a list of tweets by calling the processor get tweets for state function and then loop through the tweets and print them. Let's say you were doing that. Now you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. You have a dependency here. How does this method work? And the short answer is at this point, it doesn't. It doesn't work. I haven't implemented it yet. If you take a look at the processor class, I haven't implemented it. By the way, I want to point out a couple things. You'll notice I have a tweet class and a state class and a coordinate class here. I do not include coordinate, state, and tweet in my integration strategies. I'm actually always going to implement state, tweet, and coordinate first. Can anyone tell me why? Why would I implement state, tweet, and coordinate first? Why, why am I not including those in my top-down, bottom-up integration? Why am I always doing those first? The reason is this class is basically a glorified string. Remember that when we're talking about objects, there's a certain subset of objects that we consider POJOs, and POJOs are like database records. They store information, but the objects don't really do anything. They're just a record of information. So POJOs, plain old Java objects, we often just say implement those beforehand because simulating a POJO would actually take more effort than just implementing a class that effectively has fields and getters and setters. And yeah, an equals function, but this is basically a glorified string. So it would take more work to simulate a state object than it would to just implement the state object. So we're just going to implement the state object. So I'm not including those. I'm going to assume they exist because, again, they're just effectively data records. The UI class is not a database record. Right, the UI class does stuff. The controller class does, or not the controller, excuse me, the processor class does stuff. I actually don't use the controller class here. Uh, let me, anyway. So I have this processor. It has a dependency. So how do we actually implement this dependency? Well, if you take a look at the moment, we haven't implemented this dependency at all. It just returns null. This is a method stub. It compiles, but it doesn't return. It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. Except we can actually change this method stub to be more useful. We, oh, excuse me. We could change this method stub to be more like this. We produce this, if this function is supposed to produce a list of tweets, then we produce a list of tweets. 
So something like this. And then from there, I can use this stub to test my UI. So I put this in here, I'll enter. I of course need to make a class for my tweet. And so let's say that or I need to make a constructor for tweet. Let's say this tweet contains string text and let's call this coordinate coordinate. Now, this class is going to pass in some state. And I do want to make sure that this coordinate's reasonably close to the state. So how can I do this? Well, it's reasonable to assume I would also implement some function um, that can get the coordinate for a given state. Um, but really, we don't have to make that work here. I'll, I'll go to an example later of how we can actually uh, do some kind of filtering. So this would just be tweet. Uh, what is my tweet going to take in? It's going to take in. I'm actually also going to take in string timestamp. Public tweet uh, tech or string. And actually, I'm just going to if you don't know this is here, I'm just going to go to code. Um, where's generate generate constructor. And I'm just going to include all three fields. And there we go. So from my processor now, I just pass in some dummy data like, hi, mom. Uh, let's do new coordinate. And I actually, I don't really have a constructor for the coordinate yet. So we're just going to, you know, again, you could fill in your own dummy data there if you wanted. And then what was the third timestamp? Let's go with um, what is right now. It's 2020. 0416 space 125700. And I just do this three times. I, I fill in my own dummy data. Uh, hi, Dad. This is at 1258. Um. Go Mountaineers, something like that. The point is, I fill in my own dummy data here. And then what enables me to test this function is simply, uh, oops, that shouldn't be a bracket. All right, wait, yes, it should be. Why is this not? Oh, that's right, because I copied from PowerPoint and sometimes PowerPoint doesn't act nicely. That's what I did. Sorry, having trouble reading today. I accidentally copied the method signature, which I didn't mean to do. Oh, forgot a semicolon. The point is, I create just three tweets of dummy data, and this is going to now allow me to test my UI independent of actually how processor or data layer work. I can now actually build and test this UI. Granted, a limitation is that I will always get the same three tweets, but this is still going to give me enough to test with. If I want to test how my UI displays tweets, how the UI gets the state, etc. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Now from there, once I'm happy with processor, once I'm reasonably happy this works, if you do it top... Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Oh, you're going to have 
data, test your UI anyway. Why go this route? Um, you're still going to have to test this route, but the advantage is this lets you get the a demo of the UI out in front of the stakeholder at the beginning of the process, which is often what you want to do. Whereas bottom up, you only have a UI to show the client at the end of the process and any changes are then potentially going to necessitate changes that are full stack from bottom to top. Whereas you can get the customer happy with the top and then any module that you add later, you can reasonably expect that the UI won't change. So that means to say that, and, and by the way, changes don't pro changes to interface don't propagate downwards when you're doing UI development or sorry, when you're doing a three tier architecture. Changes the interface propagate upwards, but once the client's reasonably happy, you can then build the interface from there and not reasonably expect it to change. Because the UI tends to be the most unstable thing. It tends to be the thing that needs to change the most. But if you make changes to the UI, um, or if you need new features that the UI doesn't support, you could then um, you know, add those features in a, in a top-down way as well. Whereas if you do all the bottom-up development, that is all the data, all the control, all the processor, or excuse me, all the controller, and then at the top all the UI, and then the person's not happy with the UI and they want changes, you may have to re-implement everything bottom-up again. Again, bottom-up is fine. I'm not saying this is better than bottom-up. I'm just giving a use case. No, 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 no. That was a very sensible question. Uh, I know. I, I hit, because I know you, you meant to hit the apostrophe and hit enter. That makes sense. So now we're done with this part. We're ready to move on. So now, again, the goal of the stub, simulate just enough functionality so that the module can be tested. And then write the stubs uh, when stubs are simpler than, say, the underlying process. So now we can continue and we can implement the processor now that we're happy with the UI, we implement the processor using stubs in the data layer. So our processor may now replace this code with something like, replace this with something like this. Now, of course, we're now relying on a tweet reader object. So I'm just going to quickly say um, tweet reader Tweet reader. I'm going to assume this variable exists. It's created somehow. Tweet reader, all tweets. I need to add this function. This is going to get all the tweets. And then from there, I also need a state finder. And a state finder is going to be its own class. Uh, and I need to create that class as well and add that method and actually this is going to take in determine state uh this is going to take in tweet and so i need to take in here tweet t and again i can implement this for the time with dummy data for example the state object here may just be this state object. Because if I'm trying to get the, the tweets from the state, you know, I may just want to return whatever the state here is. Um, sorry, I, I'm actually getting, I'm getting a bit behind myself. Let me, let me restart that sentence. So the idea here is now we're implementing the processor, but I'm just going to use stubs underneath. So it might be something like return new state Ohio. I don't know why you'd want to return Ohio, but you could do something like that. And I need to add this constructor. Um, something like that. And I could add this constructor, but now the problem that we run into is, okay, well... This means that in this stub, every state I get is going to be Ohio. 
if I use this stub. So now it's not as simple as just producing a stub that gives dummy data. I may want to coordinate my dummy data to give me, say, meaningful testing. For example, this tweet reader is going to give me all tweets. And in theory, I can write this the same way as before. So I'm going to go to my tweet reader class. And I'm going to just return that dummy data we had earlier. More or less the same dummy data. But now I'm going to, and again, creating my dummy data, hi, mom. Hi, dad. Go Mountaineers. And I, I'm, I'm intentionally not going to do the full constructor here. Um, but this would be my dummy data in the data layer, the same as before. I'm not going to write the whole constructor. Point being just to say, you create this dummy data in Tweet Reader. But now I need to coordinate this because I want to meaningfully test something where the state is the state I'm looking for and something where it's the state I'm not looking for. So let's say I were testing uh, this with Ohio. I might return um, in my state finder, I might do something like if t.text.equals, hi mom, I return new state Ohio, else return new state Maryland. And the advantage of doing this, the reason I would do this, is that this gives me two different sets of tweets, one from Ohio and one from Maryland. This will allow me to, in my processor, differentiate, actually test this if statement. So let me test that if statement to make sure that it is... Um, you know, I'm distinguishing the state correctly in this line of code. But so the key is top, the key to top down is lots and lots and lots of stubs. But you start from the thing with no dependencies, implement that first, and then end with the thing that has everything either directly or indirectly, depending on it. The last step we would do is we would actually implement tweet reader and state finder but that would be the last step are there any questions okay so this is designed to be a shorter topic because from there we're going to jump into design patterns and i'm not going to start that lecture today but what I'm going to remind you is just like bottom-up and top-down integration, there are times where both have, the, both have their advantages. You don't always do one or the other. Design patterns are a thing that when you need it, you use it. But you don't just arbitrarily use design patterns for the sake of using them. You use them for the specific situations they're beneficial for. So when we start talking about design patterns next week, uh, we will uh, build off that idea. But otherwise, actually, today's lecture is going to be really short. It's going to be 38 minutes long. So if there are any questions, I will take them. But otherwise, I, ex I expected more questions and just didn't see any. Uh, so I kind of just plowed right through. Um, and that's going to be it today. And if you're good, then have a great weekend. Best of luck with Homework 6. Do the questions have to be on this? Uh, at least for the next couple minutes. I want to give people a chance to ask relevant questions to the class. Let's say questions relevant to the class are fine for now. And then if you want other questions, sure, I can answer those. Oh, you did? Yeah. 
I like it. It's um they just had a really really massive patch uh that com- that really changed the game. It made the towers like League of Legends, which I I don't like this patch, but whatever. They didn't ask me. Do you have a preference for one of the types of implementation? I still tend to do bottom up, but that's because most of my development is done where I'm the customer, where I'm producing something for a student, but I'm I can reasonably I think act that way. I would do top down integration if I were doing a very agile project. Um but none of my projects have been super agile in nature. Agile meaning I expect I'm going to develop them long term. I'm constantly interacting with the customer. I'm doing short term development. I would do top down in that case to get the minimum viable product. But I tend to do bottom up. And I would say bottom up is more common. It's just worth knowing that top down exists. That you can do top down. And the advantages of it. Namely you get a UI out quickly. All right. Well, um, okay. Any other any other questions that not related to this class? If you don't want them to be. Heck, I'll even answer questions about Heroes of the Storm. What's my username? Uh, it it is it is my name that I use to identify myself in the video game. That's my username. Uh, every in fact, everyone's username is that. It's it's just it's just it's it's not a unique identifier because Blizzard games let you uh, you don't have to have a unique username, but it's the thing that just helps people identify you. That's what it is. I'm not I'm obviously not going to give out my username. All right. Well, I guess I'll end lecture there. Uh, Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend.